right, guys, let's get started with the session this morning. Hope everyone's morning has been going well. Um, our session is actually going to be hosted by uh, two of our experts at Aussies Group, our a QAAC registered counselor, uh, Ms. Priyanka Mathur, and uh, later on she'll be joined by our registered migration agent, Mr. Park Patel. So to tell you a little bit about um, Priyanka, um, she has been um, experienced in this field for over five years now. And um, she's skilled as an IT professional herself um, and as an education advisor too. Um, she's a consummate professional with specialist knowledge in the information technology sector, having worked as an assistant professor herself in the ICT field. She's a subject matter expert in consulting for courses, and um, these especially give a head start to international students in the information technology stream. So um, she's one of the best people here at Aussies to assist you, and um, let's hear more from us. Welcome, Ms. Priyanka Mathur. Thank you so much, Riddhi, for such a warm welcome and the introduction. Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining this session. Um, myself, Priyanka Mathur, as Riddhi has already introduced me, uh, so I will not waste your time and my time in introducing myself, and um, I'll just start the session. Let's get started. I hope you all can, sh uh, can see my screen. And uh, let me get started with the agenda of uh, today's um, session. L uh, as you can see on the screen, this is pretty much that much only, which I'll be um, sharing with you guys. So the agenda for today's session is um, I'll be starting with the industry projection or employment projection for the next five years in Australia. Uh, then I will share the career opportunities that you might aim for after completing an IT course in Australia. Um, see, you all are aspirants um, and um, you all have come here to, um, you know, for uh, migration advice as well as for um, your career advice. So I will uh, shed a bit of a light towards what are your career opportunities after you finish the IT courses in Australia and also the salary expect expectations that you can have um, after completing your course. Um, I'll um, also discuss a bit about entry requirements uh, to the universities and providers and which uh, universities um, are popular for IT courses and the uh, scholarships that we have right now. Um, OK, let's get started with the next um, agenda. So as you can pretty much see on this slide, um, I have collected data for five years industry projection over here. Uh, so according to National Skills Commission projections, overall employment in Australia is projected to increase in 17 of the 19 broad industries over the five years to November 2025. So this data is up till um, this data will give you an idea about coming five years. Um, ICT industry is itself projected to increase by around 100,000 jobs, um, which is approximately a growth of 26% over the next five years to November 2025 which means the demand for ICT professionals will increase. See, we all know that ICT is uh, the most popular um, industry um, and also you guys can earn a good amount of money after you finish your course um, in IT. So I'll just uh, you know share a little bit information about that and then we'll go towards the um, providers and scholarships that they have. So. Um, if you can see in this data, we can see that the percentage increase of employment for network professionals, um, business and system analyst and database and system administrators is quite high um, as compared to other ICD professions. So now let's have a look at some occupations. So these are the career opportunities. These are the possible job outcomes uh, which you can aim for after completing the course. Um, so 
this is pretty much this much uh, analyst programmer computer network and system engineer developer programmer ict business analyst ict security specialist um, and uh, multimedia specialist you know there are different kind of um, jobs that are available in the market and when you look at the um, the seek.com data uh, all of these jobs are uh, pretty much high in demand so now let's discuss a little bit about money um if we can see at this slide um i have collected data of the weekly um, median salary of uh, the most popular in demand uh, jobs in Australian market. So look at this ICT business and system analysts. The median weekly salary for them is 2,274 Aussie dollars. So I think that's pretty good. And if we go to ICT project managers, this is even better. So this is um, Australian dollars, 2,766. That is pretty good salary as a week. Um, if you are earning this much, there will be lots of uh, money flowing to your account. <laughs> um, uh, and then next is ICT support and test engineers, um, which is around $2,019 uh, per week. Then ICT security specialist. Okay, with security specialist, I would like to tell you one thing that uh, most of the IT courses in Australia have this specialization of cybersecurity, which is which is very much in demand these days, and uh, even it is a it is a very good migration pathway as well. Uh, when Parth will take care of the migration part, he will be able to tell you how uh, you know good it is to opt for that option. Um, so ICT security specialist uh, is not bad as well. It is 1,932 uh, weekly uh, median salary, which is, um, I mean, it's it's really good. And uh, the good thing is um, with this occupation, I would say that uh, most of people um, get, get afraid of choosing this specialization because um, it's it's lots of work, lots of data, lots of um, you know assignments and everything that you need to do. But uh, believe me, guys, it's not that difficult. Nothing is difficult um, if you have that uh, passion of doing it. And I would love something uh, like this to you know work for um, as in security specialist. You know, um, it's it's really interesting. It's very interesting. Um, anyways. Coming next to computer network professionals, which is um, $2,021 per week. Um, I would say this is also really good, um, really good uh, salary that you can have. Um, so uh, this data is according to joboutlook.gov.au, um, but you can look according to your convenience if you have um, any other uh, data. So this slide is all about, you know, I'll be um, also sharing with you which state has demand for which occupation. Uh, let's look at this slide. Here I have shared a data regarding ICT business and systems analyst, uh, which is very, very popular um, occupation in IT industry. If you can see here, we all know that Victoria and NSW um, are very big job markets for ICT professionals, but uh, others are also not very bad. If you are thinking about, you know, moving to other states than Victoria and NSW, um, you can think about um, um, QLD as well as Western Australia, as well as Canberra. I can see a good growth in terms of if you're looking for business analyst or system analyst, um, a good percentage of job openings are available. Uh, okay, so next let's look at the uh, ICT project managers. Yeah, so same uh, NSW and Victoria has uh, a good amount of job openings, good percentage, but um, Canberra is not bad as well as QLD is uh, doing good in this case. So if you are looking for options of you know moving uh, i would say uh, these two 
Canberra and Queensland is really good at this stage in terms of job openings. Next is Western Australia, of course, and um, you have more prospective uh, pathways as well. Um, let's look at ICT support and test engineers, which you generally, it, it's an entry level uh, job um, in ICT industry. Um, looking at NSW, uh, it is beating everything, but I think you have good uh, pathways in NSW as well as in um, Queensland. So just think about it. You, If you finish your course and get a ICT support as a job opening, you, you know, you can, you, you can look at Queensland and NSW both. Um, next is security specialist, as I uh, have um, shared earlier that uh, security jobs are you know very much available and people are <laughs> afraid of uh, enrolling into these courses but uh, look at the data here so canberra queensland nsw and victoria all are um, all are very good percentages uh, in terms of uh, having job openings so I would say um, it's it's a very good job market in NSW as well. So uh, that's that's a good option. Computer network professionals of uh, Western Australia is good after uh, Queensland, Victoria, and uh, NSW. So you, if you are doing a networking course or you know looking at uh, job perspectives um, after uh, you doing your course, uh, you can even think about. Uh, Western Australia and South Australia as well in this case. So all this data is, you know, to give you a little bit idea about, uh, you know, if you're looking for regional options or looking to move um, interstate, you know, you can look at these, this data and, you know, you can decide where you can go. Okay, so next, uh, let me talk about some entry requirements. I'm not sure, but there might be still some audience here which are still looking to join a course or maybe from offshore you might have joined. You know, you're looking to know more about um, if you are eligible for a particular course or not. So this is for those who are still looking to enter into an ICT course. So let's look at this slide. Entry requirements I have mentioned here, they are pretty much very general entry requirements. Uh, for bachelor courses, you must have completed year 12 or equivalent, um, and the IELTS overall band score uh, should not be less than six and no individual band below six as well. And the uh, equivalent scores are also acceptable like PTE in this case. Coming to master entry requirements, a bachelor degree or a higher award in any discipline from a recognized higher education institution or equivalent. Guys, this particular line, but why I have added here is you need to talk to our consultants regarding if your a bachelor degree uh, is equivalent to what a particular university requires. So, and the IELTS overall band of 6.5 with no individual band below 6. That is uh, for the academic module only. Just remember that. Um, so, I think this is pretty clear. And uh, next. So, I'm going to this with the universities and providers uh, along with the fee structure and the scholarships that they have. So, my number one university go to university is always uh, Swinburne University. Um, I have heard from uh, most of my clients from offshore that, you know, universities are pretty high in fee as in fee structure, you know, they're very expensive. But believe me, guys, these days, if you just talk to one of the consultant um, in Aussie's group, you will get to know that uh, how you can take benefits from the scholarships. Uh, there are lots of scholarships available from lots of universities and providers these days, um, especially when you can um, study online from offshore as well. Um, they are here to support you, um, believe me. So uh, let me start with Swinburne University. Swinburne University has this uh, Bachelor of IT course and Master of IT course as well. Bachelor fees is generally 31,600 per year, but I'll uh, share the scholarship 
um, slide side by side with you guys so that you will have an idea how much it will come down to. So if you look at Bachelor of Information Technology, it is this much, but um, if you go with the 30% STEM scholarship, you can see here that Sunban University has got this 30% STEM scholarship for postgraduate courses, as well as they have International Excellence Scholarship as well, which is 10% to 75%. So guys, you can avail up to 75% scholarship in Swinburne University if you are eligible for that uh, scholarship. So uh, I would uh, suggest you contact our um, um, consultants or you can come to me as well to know how much uh, scholarship is available in what. Also, let me tell you about Master of IT course in Swinburne University. This is my favorite course. So when you look at their website, the Master of IT has lots of specializations as well as um, um, there is one course Master of IT in professional computing, which they are giving 30% scholarship. And uh, that 30% scholarship will take down the fees to just around 9,000 something dollars per semester, which is like every other uh, private provider would also have that, that fee structure. So if you're looking for a university degree in IT, I would highly, highly prefer Swinburne, Southern Cross and Charles Sturt University because all these universities are running very good scholarship if you look at Southern Cross University, the main USP of Southern Cross University is that they provide you good credits. Let's say you have completed a semester or two semesters already in some um, university and you know you're looking to change your university. I would say uh, Southern Cross University is the best option because they will provide you as much as credits as you can have. Also, they have campuses in regional areas as well. So don't be afraid with the fees uh, written in on their websites or just talk to our consultants. I think that is the best way to understand the actual fee structure coming down after the scholarship. If you look at Southern Cross University, the regional scholarship, they are just giving away 5000 per year. And uh, there is this diversification scholarship, 8,000 per year. You need to check if you are eligible for that as well or not. Outstanding academic scholarship is around 15,000 per year. So if you are a very good scholar, I would say just try looking at the eligibility criteria along with our consultants and you will find out if you are eligible for this scholarship or not. And then let's come to Charles Sturt University. Charles Sturt University has the campus, um, has their campuses in regional areas, regional Victoria, regional NSW, as well as um, in Melbourne, Sydney as well. So what you can do is, um, you know, talking to our consultants, checking what scholarships are going on uh, with uh, these universities. And um, if you see here, the Charles Sturt University study group, which is in Sydney, Melbourne mainly. Um, so you can grab 15% scholarship for all undergraduate courses throughout the duration and 25% for all the postgraduate courses throughout the duration. So what um, you're getting here is, I don't think there is any eligibility criteria for this uh, particular scholarship, but you, you have to be eligible to enter that course. You have to meet all the entry requirements to enter that course to go for this uh, scholarship. Coming back to Victorian Institute of Technology, they are very good option if you are looking for uh, credit exemptions and uh, also if you are looking for a flexible provider. So I would say go with Victorian Institute of Technology for that and um, they also have uh, ongoing scholarships. So for Bachelor of IT, they have 20% scholarship at the moment. So guys, I'm sharing this all with you, but just to let you know, the next intake would be the July intake. So if you're looking to change, you're looking to go for, to change your provider or you know move the state just talk to our uh, consultants as soon as possible because these scholarship have um, limited seats 
and you need to go for it before someone else grabs. So, you know, just uh, talk to our consultants about these. So Master of IT in Victorian Institute of Technology has 25% of scholarship, um, which is really good. I I think it would come down to around 8,000 or maybe $7,000 per semester. So just check with the consultants. Uh, and Kent Institute is another institute which is uh, providing very good scholarships. The Bachelor of IT comes down to around 7000 per semester. Um, here you can see that up to 1200 uh, per three plus 30 percent um, scholarship they are providing considering you are meeting the criteria. Um, so that you need to that you need to you know that is something you need to consult with the uh, counselors. OK, so these were Bachelor of Information Technology and Master of Information Technology courses. Uh, but uh, let me talk about there is another course which is uh, very popular these days in market, which is Advanced Diploma of IT or you can say Advanced Diploma of Telecommunication. This course, guys, is um, a little bit related to IT and a little bit related to the engineering part. So if you are looking for something which finishes in two years and you don't have to do the master, bachelor, or maybe you want to do something in within your TR, maybe you want to do something after your TR, you have already done the master of IT or bachelor of IT. So I would say um, this course is really, really helpful. Um, this has a a pathway as well as uh, you know you can have the occupation of a, a telecommunication network planner which um, you can get assessed by uh, engineers australia and these courses on the website you can see that uh, they are for two years they are uh, 22000 27000 somewhere it is something but with milcom and danford institute uh, you can easily uh, get the uh, i think milcom has reduced the uh, fee structure for this course which is like for two years it is only um, 13,000 or 15,000 and Danford also have 13 to 15,000 um, for two years. So guys, if you're looking for something, you know, you know, to extend your visa or after TR or uh, looking to study something which can lead you uh, to the pathway, I would say uh, go for this course. Um, you can have more information for these courses through our counselors. Um, so that's all for my presentation today. My session is, um, I think I have finished on time. Uh, if you have any questions, you can also ask at the end of today. I think at 5.30 or 5 o'clock, we have a question and answer session as well. So you all can join in that session and um, ask your questions and we'll be uh, happy to help you. Um, now I would like Mr. Parth Patel to take care of the migration part of this session. Um, sure. Uh, thank you, Priyanka, for uh, providing detailed information on IT courses, um, institutions where you can study these courses, occupations, and its career pathways. Um, hello, everyone. I am Parth, um, working as a registered migration agent at OSIS Group. Um, I'm going to talk about um, IT occupations, the skills assessment requirements, and uh, permanent residency pathways through this kind of uh, IT related courses. So um, let's start. So as I mentioned, we are going to talk about IT occupations and its pathways. So firstly, um, if you look at the current occupation list, um, I have mentioned over here the occupations which are on the current occupation list. Um, the first one is um, MLT SSL list, which is known as medium to long term skill shortage list. So the occupations which are in high demand in Australia will be listed on this occupation list occupations which are in short term low demand in australia will be part of short term skilled occupation list so if you look at the left hand side uh, we have mentioned the occupations which are part of mlt ssl if occupation is in medium to long term skilled strategic list that means occupation is in long term demand high to high demand and that's where you will have more options to look at so mainly uh, if you look at the occupations there are some programming occupations such as analyst programmer developer programmer, 
software application programmers or software engineers. These are part of software and application programmers. And then the occupations which are business analyst, system analyst that are part of analyst occupation category. Apart from that, you are looking at computer network and system engineer occupation. Then after multimedia specialist, security specialist, these are also part of the medium to long term skill shortage list. Um, as I was saying, uh, whatever the permanent residency options, uh, when you look at the visa categories like GSM, point tested visa, employer sponsored visa, all that options you get if your occupation is on this list. The occupation chief information office or the second occupation that is only in MLT SSL list for the employer sponsored visa category. So if you are looking at point tested visa, then you cannot look at this visa. Uh, I mean 189 visa because this occupation is not part of MLT SSL for the point tested visa. For the short term occupation, there are a lot of other occupations as well, which are part of short term occupation list. That means occupations are in low demand in Australia. And uh, if occupation is in low demand in Australia, you will have to compulsory look at state sponsorship. Otherwise, you can't apply for your permanent residency. Um, if you look at the skills assessment requirement, because if you look at the point registered visa, that is 189 skilled independent visa or the 190 state sponsored visa or the 491 state or family sponsored visa. Or if you look at 186 employer sponsored visa under the direct entry for all this visa, you require a mandatory skills assessment. Without skills assessment, you cannot apply for permanent residence in this visa categories. So if you look at skills assessment requirements, skills assessment uh, is done by occupation authority called Australian Computer Society ACS. So you will have to meet their requirements. If you meet the requirements, you apply to them. If they consider that yes, you are meeting the requirements, they will assess you positively. If they see that you are not meeting the requirements, they will give you a negative outcome, so which you cannot use it for your permanent residency pathways. So uh, first pathway through ACS, if we are looking at that is through your Australian qualification. So if you have got Australian qualification, at least at a level of a bachelor's degree or higher degree, um, um, and if you have either a professional year program or if you got one year of experience post Australian qualification. So you have two choice if you have got Australian qualification that qualification is at a level of a bachelor's degree or higher degree plus you either require a professional year program or you require one year of experience in the relevant occupation. This one year of experience must be at least for 20 hours per week. If you don't have that 20 hours per week experience, you cannot apply. So uh, that's about the requirements. Uh, if your qualification is Australian qualification, the next one is through qualification which you have gained overseas or it can be qualification which is in Australia. Um, so now if you're looking at qualification, IT qualification, uh, if you have achieved through uh, studying in Australia or studying overseas, um, there are two pathways in this. If your qualification is major in IT, so it has uh, generally as per the requirements, major qualification means at least depending on the number of years of study, 50% of qualification should be relevant to IT. If it is two years of qualification, that is suppose master's degree if you have done, at least one year of study must be relevant to IT. Um, if it is three years degree such as bachelor's degree, then at least three one third of the qualification must be relevant to IT. If it is four years degree, one fourth of the qualification must be relevant to IT, something like that. So if your qualification is IT major, um, if you have done a bachelor's degree or a higher degree, and if your qualification is relevant to the nominated occupation, that means if you wanted to get a skills assessment relevant to software engineer, for example, your study must be relevant to IT. That is, if it is master's degree, at least half of the study, that is 50% of study must be relevant to uh, IT. So that can be, you must have, you can have studied networking, programming, or uh, multimedia, or any, any IT related subjects are fine. The second requirement is your qualification must be highly relevant to your nomin nominated occupation. That means if you have studied IT degree, but if your subjects are not relevant to software engineering, you still don't meet the requirement in a way. So your qualification must have the components relevant to software engineering. Then you just need two years of experience completed within last 10 years. Or if your experience is more than 10 years old, then you need four years of experience. Same way. The second option is if you have a degree which is in IT, but your suppose the occupation you have chosen is software engineer and your study is relevant to networking. That means your study is not highly relevant to your nominated occupation. In that case, if you have four years of experience, you still meet the skills assessment requirement. The next one is 
if you have studied IT degree, but it's not major in IT. Ma not major in IT means if it is a master's degree, as I said, 50% of content, if it is relevant to IT, then it's considered major. But if it is 33%, of content is relevant to IT, then it's considered IT minor. That is in between 33% to 50% if it is, then it's considered as IT minor degree. Same way if you look at bachelor's degree, if it is three years degree, that means one third of the component must be relevant to IT. If it is major IT major degree, if you wanted to consider that. So that means 33% of a bachelor's degree, which is for three years is considered IT major. But if it is 20, 22%, uh, content relevant to IT, then it's considered IT minor. So in that case, if your qualification is highly relevant to the nominated occupation, so if you are saying I wanted to get assessment under software engineer, and if your qualification is um, relevant to software engineer, then you need five years of experience completed in last 10 years, or if it is not within last 10 years, you need a total of six years of experience. So as I said, if you have studied a degree, which is um, just an example, masters of IT, or masters of something else, but then that, that has some uh, programming subjects, which is at least 20% of subjects are relevant to programming, but it's not major in IT because only 20% subjects are relevant to IT and that 20% subjects are relevant to programming as well. Then you need five years of experience because your degree is minor IT minor, but your subjects which you have studied is also relevant to programming and you wanted to get your skills assessment under software engineer. So five years of experience will suffice if it is within last 10 years, if it is within uh, if, if it is not within 10 years, then you will you will need six years of experience. Same way, if your qualification is not relevant to software engineering, it's IT minor, but not relevant to software engineering. It's relevant to probably network engineer, but then it happens that a lot of time. Uh, some people get a job as a software engineer instead of network engineer, for example. So then they get experience. They can still apply for skills assessment. In that case, six years of experience is mandatory. The next um, option is through studying a diploma level qualification. So if you have studied diploma of IT or um, something relevant to IT at a diploma level, advanced diploma or associate level, you can still get a skills assessment. In this case, your qualification must be IT major. Now, if your qualification is IT major, but then the component of that study is relevant to programming. Suppose you have studied a diploma of IT major in programming and you wanted to assess under software engineer then your occupation is also relevant to your study and that's where five years of experience will be sufficient to get a positive skills assessment if it is within last 10 years if it is not within last 10 years then six years of experience will be required if your qualification is not relevant to the nominated occupation so if you wanted to get a skills assessment as a software engineer but you did diploma of it major in networking then you will need six years of experience if it is within 10 years more than 10 years old not a problem that's with your diploma qualification other option you have is if you have studied a qualification, but it's not major in IT or if it is not even minor in IT, that means a qualification is not IT at all. So, for example, if you say I have done bachelor's of um, commerce or bachelor's of accounting, which is not relevant to IT at all, um, but you have a degree at least. So if you have a degree, if you have six years of experience and you will have to submit a RPL. So in RPL, you will have to explain two IT projects which you have worked during your six years of experience or more than that years of experience, you will have to explain two project reports along with your six years of experience documents you have to submit. You can still get a positive skills assessment. So good thing with IT um, uh, applicants is a lot of time, not a lot of time, but then it happens uh, in uh, in some countries where your qualification is not relevant, but then you get a job in IT companies, you gradually learn skills and then the, you get a qualified software engineer something like that. So even if you don't have relevant qualification, you can still get a skills assessment. Six years of experience plus RPL will be required in that case. The good thing is even if you don't have any qualification, you can still qualify for skills assessment under IT. So no qualification, but you have eight years of experience. Along with that, you will have to explain two project reports relevant to IT. You can still get a skills assessment. That's about getting skills assessment. So these are the ways you can probably get a skills assessment. Once you get a skills assessment, you are or if you don't have skills assessment out of these all visas, you can look at 482 visa, which is temporary skills shortage visa, which doesn't require a skills. It's not mandatory to provide a skills assessment as part of that application. Same with the global talent visa, the 858 visa category in that you don't need a skills assessment. Other than that, every other visa requires on this uh, PPT slide, 
every other visa requires a skills assessment in order to get your permanent residency so if you get a skills assessment what options you are looking at or if you are studying it course what visa options you are looking at are this the first one first category is called general skilled migration which is also known as point tested visa where you are looking at three visa categories 189 190 and 491 these all three visas requires a skills assessment it also requires minimum of 65 points the second category is called employer sponsored visa where there are three visa categories 482 visa which is a temporary visa which can lead to permanent residency um if your occupation is on medium to long term skill shortage list that's where we talked about which occupations are considered part of mlt ssr list some occupations are considered part of short term skilled occupation list if your employer wanted to sponsor you under that occupation such as network administrator which is part of short term skilled occupation list you can get this for it to visa for 2 years but it cannot lead to permanent residency so the benefit of uh, having your occupation on mlt ssl is you can apply for all of these options 186 is a permanent employer sponsored visa which requires skills assessment 494 it's employer sponsored visa but that can only be applied if your employer is based in regional area which wanted to sponsor you, which uh, that employer wanted to sponsor you under it occupation in regional area then you can look at 494 for that also you require skills assessment the last option is called global talent visa where if you have studied it and if you prove that you are highly talented um, not just because of your getting higher grades in your um, qualification but you still have to prove other awards achievements or membership registrations publications research you have done or innovative things you have done that is what you'll have to explain and you can still get your permanent residency for global talent visa you don't need um, any employer specifically you don't need any points as such you don't need a skills assessment it's all about proving that you have a talent and immigration can consider you if you you have a specific talent as as such which not everyone have as such um if you are looking at um the point tested visa we are going to cover about some state nomination requirements um that is if you are looking at new south wales they offer sponsorship under both 190 and 491 visa for 190 currently you a lot of people might have recently migrated to new south wales because new south wales they are saying that if your occupation is on new south wales occupation list and if you are living in new south wales anywhere in new south wales it can be in sydney it can be in regional area and if you have high points you can be considered under this program so applicant applicants are required to have your occupation on the list new south wales list they have list, list of around 20 30 whatever the occupations um, this occupation list will be updated in july so the requirements may also get changed in july but this is the requirements we are talking about based on the current requirements until this financial year that is completing ending on 30th of june so most of the states have closed their program so if you are not selected by now um but they have already or you have at least submitted your application to the state then that is still fine but if you are not invited to submit the full application to the state you will have to wait for the next financial year program so you if you have high points you will be selected as per the current requirements in july the requirements may get changed so new south wales they don't give any benefits of st- Uh, studying in new south wales particularly but but benefit for the students to study in probably new south wales is they new south wales has more it opportunities compared to any other state so finding job in the relevant occupation probably you'll have more chances in new south wales compared to other state if you are looking at 491 pathway for new south wales um, they have currently two pathways there there is another pathway third pathway as well but that pro- pathway is currently closed um, so probably in july they may open their pathway but for now we are going to talk about these two pathway the first pathway is for people who are working and living in new south wales so if your occupation is part of 491 list they also have a separate list for 491 visa so if your occupation is on that list and if you are currently living and working in that closely relevant occupation so if your occupation is software engineer you are required to be working in somehow relevant software engineering or any programming occupations if you are working they can consider you if you are living and working for 12 months now they also introduced they also announced that because they found out that not many people have 12 months of experience so they said that even if you don't have 12 months of experience they can still consider you so even with 3 months of experience they can probably consider your application but anyway that program is also closed so in july we'll have to see but most likely it looks to us that the requirements for 491 program will be same for 190 they may add additional experience requirement but let's see 
for new south wales the other pathway is for the people who have studied for two years in regional new south wales so if you have studied two years in regional new south wales that study is required to be relevant to your occupation and if your occupation is on new south wales list you can still meet the state nomination requirement the good thing with 491 for new south wales is even if you have minimum of 65 points including 15 points from the state they can still nominate you victoria if you look at victoria's program is also closed Victoria for 190 and 491 currently they don't have any occupation list but they are saying that for 190 you are required to be living and working in Victoria in the relevant occupation for at least six months and your work is required to be helping in either COVID recovery or economic recovery if your employment if your work is helping in this sector then they can consider you so you'll have to submit a registration of interest application if they select you then you have to apply a full application to the state. 491 if you look at for Victoria they say instead of six months which is for 190 for 491 they say you have to just work for three months in regional Victoria but that work must be in the relevant occupation as well so if you don't have IT job Victoria cannot sponsor you consider that way so 491 three months you have to work in regional area the employer with whom you are working must be operating the business in regional area for at least two years of time so it must be two years old business lot of time people also ask us that if business is located in Melbourne and they are shifting the business from here to say Geelong, uh, Melbourne they are operating the business for more than two years five years of time and but then you are just moving business to Geelong which is recent business now it's not operating in Geelong for two years you don't meet the requirement as such. So you are also required to prove that you, your work is helping in either health, medical, um, medical research, life science, agric agriculture, food technology or digital sector that is IT sector, you can still qualify for the program. For 190 also we have received invites for the people whose occupation is in IT but then their projects were somehow relevant to health, aged care related occupation uh, work, they were invited to apply for the state nomination as such. In both of these programs, even if you have less points, 65 points altogether, including the state's points, still states were nominating the applicants. So good thing with Victoria is they don't look at high points. For Victoria for 190, they look at high points. That's the difference. Um, Canberra, if you look at, that is also a very popular state nowadays. For Canberra, again, two options, 190, 491. For 190, the basic requirement for them is your occupation must be on their current occupation list, critical, ACT critical list. Um, and you are required to be working there for six months full time. The good thing is you can be working in any occupation. If you are working in any occupation, you still meet the requirements. So the basic two requirements are having your occupation on the list and having at least six months of full time experience on TFN. If you have worked as a self-employed that is on ABN, you are required to work for one year and every week you have to earn $1,000 at least. Then only you qualify for the program. Um, on top of this, they have a separate point system called ACT metric system. So they have a separate way of calculating the points. They say that the person who scored more points in that point system will be given the priority. They will be selecting that applicant's post. So the basic requirements are the work experience and occupation on the list. On top of that, person with higher points in the metrics will be given the priority, will be selected first to apply for the full application. 491, the difference is they say your work experience if you are doing there for three months just three months and it can be part-time or full-time so people who are on a student visa suppose they already consume that 485 temporary graduate visa or the full-time work rights visa they can go on a student visa they can still work part-time they can still get 491. the another good thing is earlier they were saying that if your occupation is not on canberra's list they can still consider you for 491 program but Recently, they changed the policy. They said that your occupation must be on the list as well. But I'm expecting that in July, when the new requirements come in, they will be saying that for 491, your occupation cannot, if even if it is not on the list, they can still nominate you. So let's see. The good thing is, Canberra was having quota of 1,400 people that they can sponsor. This year, the coming year, July onwards, they are saying they are increasing the quota to 2,000 people. That means it will be a bit easier comparatively so if you are planning to relocate i think canberra is very good option as such if you are looking at south australia south australia's requirements are a bit complicated it depends on every occupation so for one occupation it can be something else for another occupation occupation they may be asking for something else but generalized requirements if i talk about they have two pathways one is for the people who have graduated from south australia 
graduated means the requirement is you must have completed at least one year of study in south australia that must be at a level of a bachelor's degree or a higher degree um, and you are required to be currently working in your occupation for at least three months it can be more they may ask for more depending on the occupation but minimum requirement is three months of relevant job so first pathways study in south australia work in the relevant occupation for three months six months whatever the requirements by the time you qualify for the south australia the second pathway is through work pathway where you haven't studied in south australia so you studied in melbourne and you relocated to south australia in that case they ask for more years of experience that is at least they ask for in between one and a half year of experience and it can be two years of experience depending on your occupation so you'll have to go as per your occupation um, the good thing is there are some exemptions available for the experience requirement. Suppose if you work in regional area in South Australia, you can get some exemption. If you have studied there, if you have got talent, they can give you some exemption as such. So every application will be assessed differently. For 491 for South Australia, again two pathways. One, if you have studied in South Australia, where they say bachelor's or higher degree in South Australia and at least three months of experience. Um, and for a work pathway, Good thing is the requirements for the work will be a bit lesser compared to the 190 state nomination requirement. So for 190, they were asking for at least one and a half year of experience. In this category, they ask for at least six months of experience. The second option for 491 is whatever your occupation is, they say is that if you are living and working in outside of Adelaide, but in South Australia, so outer regional area of uh, South Australia for 12 months in any occupation, they can still nominate you for at least 491 pathway. There are some exemptions given to people who have studied there or who have a specific talent as well. So every occupation has a different requirement. So if you have any questions, you consult us. We can advise you accordingly. If you are looking at Tasmania, Tasmania again have two pathways, 190, 491. For 190, they have two options. You either study there for two years in Tasmania, that is Tasmania graduate pathway. So you are you are required to study for two years in Tasmania. And you are also required to explain that how that two years of study is helping you to uh, achieve or gain some additional skills which can help you to find uh, or secure employment in Tasmania or any other state, but preferably in Tasmania. Uh, for work pathway, they say that you are required to work for six months full time in the same occupation in your related occupation and your occupation must be on Tasmania's occupation list currently. Tasmania's occupation list does not have IT occupation. So you cannot qualify even if you go there and work there for six months full time for 190 pathway. But if they add this occupation say in July, you can possibly apply as well. If you look at 491 for Tasmania, for Tasmania, they have again two options. They have more options. They have another two options as well, but we are going to cover these two. Um, Tasmania work pathway. That's where they say if you have worked for six months full time in Tasmania in any occupation, they can still nominate you. So six months full time you have to work in Tasmania. Some jobs they have exempted, uh, ex uh, exempted. They say that some jobs such as Uber driving, cleaning, security, petrol station jobs, fast food re uh, jobs, retail store jobs. Some jobs will not be considered, but any other kind of job if you are doing, they can consider. It's better that you do if it is very low level job, it's better that you do that kind of job such as if you are working as um, a waiter or farm hand, all that jobs. It's better that if you do far away in proper regional area, then they can consider you. Otherwise, they may not nominate you because they says we don't have shortage of very low level skills in our state. And uh, second pathway is for people who have studied in Tasmania. They ask for at least one year of study in Tasmania and you are still ex required to explain that how that study is helping in future. They are also going to add some requirements from 1st of July saying that whatever course you are going to do that should be under priority list as well if you are not going to study that on a student visa. So if, when you are looking for studying in Tasmania, you also have to choose a right course. If you study any one year course, you may not qualify for the program as well. So you have to probably speak with the education team. They will let you know uh, which courses are on the current occupation list for Tasmania. So you better to study that kind of courses. If you look at Western Australia, they have a same requirements for 190 and 491 state nomination. Um, they have two pathways. One is for the graduates of the Western Australia and another pathway is for people whose occupation is on their list, but they have very limited occupations, mainly relevant to health. And that's where most of the people, they don't qualify for that program. So we are going to talk about people who study in South uh, Western Australia, how they can nominate or how they can apply for the program. So for these requirements, 
applicant is required to have studied for two years in Western Australia um, in any college um, or any university. Occupation on Western Australia, so your occupation must be, they have a list of occupation called Western Australia graduate list. So your occupation must be on that list. Otherwise, you cannot qualify for the program. And you must to you are required to have at least six months of experience anywhere in anywhere in Australia or six months of employment contract full time in Western Australia. So either a job offer in Western Australia or six months of experience anywhere. So if you have studied in Perth, but you came and worked for six months in Melbourne, you can still qualify for Western Australia program. That's the good thing with uh, Western Australia. But the problem is you are required to study two years no matter what. Otherwise, you don't qualify. You cannot qualify for the program for Western Australia. Northern Territory, if you look at, they have two pathways through work and through study. If you study two years in Northern Territory, you can qualify for the program. But along with two years of study, this is after two years of study, you are required to have full time work rights visa for next six months where you have to prove that you made sufficient efforts to find job in the relevant occupation. If you don't have full time work rights left after that, you cannot qualify for 190 program. So to both of these requirements for work pathway, this is you are required to work for two years full time in the relevant occupation. If you don't have full time work rights, you can't qualify for the program, but they may exercise some exemption based on every case to case basis. So even if you have worked not on a full time basis, you can still try for the state nomination, but it's not guaranteed because the official requirement is this. But we have seen that they have exempted some of the applicants as such, so you can always try if you are based in Northern Territory living at least for one year in that state. 491 same with two options. This uh, study pathway for the people who have studied two years, but they don't have the option of working full time, so they can look at 491. For the full time work, if you have worked for six months full time in the relevant occupation and if you have stayed for one year in Northern Territory, you can still qualify the, for the program. You're also required to provide a job offer for one year of time. So when you are working for the employer, six months you have worked, you're also required to prove that they are happy to offer you for one more year, like the job for one more year. Otherwise, again, you don't qualify for the program. Some exemptions can also be granted, even though these are the requirements. Queensland, if you look at 190 pathway, if you are looking at recently, they were saying that your occupation must be on the uh, working working Queensland list, but mainly they were saying that if your occupation is in critical sector, then only you can apply for the program. Secondly, you are required to be working for six months full time in the relevant occupation, then only you qualify for the program and you are still required to provide a job offer six months uh, for, for the six months as well. Otherwise, you won't qualify for the program. So occupation must be relevant to critical uh, uh, helping in critical uh, shortage, mainly the health related occupation working for six months full time and job offer. 491, two options. Your occupation is on critical list, like your occupation is helping in COVID recovery, plus you are working for three months in regional Queensland outside of Brisbane in the relevant occupation and you still have a job offer for six months or you open a business, you, you run a business for six months in regional Queensland. So you are required to buy a business which is at least two years old business running in regional Queensland. You The value of the business must be at least $100,000. You have to hire one permanent resident citizen um, and six months after you can qualify. You also require full time work rights during the six months of time. Otherwise, you don't qualify for the program. Uh, that's pretty much it for the program. Um, if you have any questions, um, we can probably cover one or two questions. We just have two, three minutes of time, so we can cover some questions. The other questions will be covering at the end of the session, um, I think at 5 p.m. today, or if you have any questions, we'll be um, contacting you because we have got your details as well, so we'll contact you personally as well. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining today's session. Like Parth mentioned, we have um, a special Q&A session where we will be dealing with uh, your cases individually and you will be getting in-depth responses from, um, you know, our education experts as well as uh, Parth himself will be doing a Q&A session at 5.30 p.m. AEST. So uh, you can deal with your questions there, but don't forget to leave your review for us. I have even left this uh, link in the chat box 
and um, we have a lot of upcoming exciting sessions during um, today as well like we have courses on um, you know regional areas so if you want to study in a regional area but you don't know what choices to make that's a very uh, you know interesting course as well as something on marketing and management so if you have studied something like MBA or human resources and you don't know where to uh, you know go from there on and if you want to know about how to get your skill assessment or your permanent residency so don't make sure make sure to not miss out on these sessions the links for all of these are uh, you know dropped in the chat box below um, but in the meantime if you have one final thing to ask for or um, Priyanka please feel free to go ahead right now you have a couple of minutes still left over someone has asked a question I have a master's in IT and majority of subjects are related to IT but only 20% is programming related can I nominate myself for programming OK, so what I was saying is if your qualification is relevant to IT and um, if you don't have major subjects relevant to programming, but as I said, 20 percent of the subjects are relevant to programming, you are still considered um, as meeting the requirements because um, the requirement for them is two third of the IT component must be relevant to the nominated occupation and pretty much 20 percent, 22 percent is considered as relevant to the nominated occupation. It also happens a lot of time that uh, you only consider the subjects which are mainly into programming, but some subjects, for an example, relevant to uh, project management can also be considered as relevant to software engineering because in software engineering also you still manage the projects, you know, so they can still consider that subjects relevant to programming and you still meet the requirement. So as you are saying, 20 percent of the subjects are relevant to programming. I think it should not be a problem for you to get a skills assessment if you have a professional year program or if you have one year of relevant experience, the pathways I have explained as uh, to get a skills assessment. All right, that brings us to the end of our session today. Thank you so much, um, Parth and Priyanka. And for the rest of you who have, you know, joined us today, uh, make sure to stay tuned for the rest of our sessions. All our links have been published on the Eventbrite page. So even if you miss them out in the chat right now, head over to our uh, event page on our social media pages and join any session that you know uh, interests you. Thank you so much, everyone. Don't forget to leave a review for us. See you again. Bye bye. See you. Thank you, everyone.